in addressing uh, Calhounism and kind of the, the antebellum environment as far as it applies to slavery, uh, we get a, the influx of several, uh, not necessarily competing, but varied ideologies. Uh, so in the prior episode, we talked about Calhounism and addressed kind of its early roots in uh, various German philosophies, uh, primarily uh, Hegelianism. Uh, at the brief mention at the at the the, the French uh, revolutionary um, Babufists, who really, for all intents and purposes, uh, formed the ideological roots of what was later adopted uh, as Marxism uh, and communism more generally. But today, we're going to talk about a gentleman named George Fitzhugh. Um, he was a legendary fire eater, Democrat, uh, one of the radical and fanatic uh, pro-slavery uh, Southerners at the time, uh, and one of the most formative uh, thinkers at the time as well. Uh, what what sets Fitzhugh apart, what makes him so uh, kind of instrumental in the larger discussion, is how seamlessly he blends uh, uh, ideas of slavery and socialism. In fact, he considered them to play off one another and considered slavery to be the solution to the problems uh, that socialism uh, pretends to address. Uh, so in 1850, uh, George Fitzhugh, uh, who, of course, owned, he was a lawyer, he, he owned a newspaper printing company, um, he was a statesman, he was a politician, he was much like Calhoun in that, although his ideas are morally reprehensible and reject the Enlightenment thought and reject the founding doctrine, uh, he was nonetheless gifted. <laughs> Uh, much to the uh, misfortune of the human race, uh, especially at the time. But in 1850, um, he attempted to enshrine all of these kind of pro-slavery, socialism as great ideas uh, in a book titled The Universal Law of Slavery, uh, which the title should already kind of inform uh, inform us on, on where he stands on the issue, uh, where where slavery is actually universal law, right? So that's implying, of course, that it's codified into the body politic through various uh, governing institutions. So throughout this book, uh, he, he touches on several elements that uh, we described earlier as, as parts of Calhounism. Uh, he discusses blacks as children who must be governed by uh, their masters who then are obligated to behave as parents. Um, one of his justifications for slavery as well, beyond kind of that basic kind of paternalistic condescension, uh, was that blacks did not plan for seasonal changes or old age. And so uh, slavery was a solution to that. Uh, the master, uh, either through preparation or I, I guess presumably through his, I don't know, I guess generosity, uh, provides for that slave should they be harmed, injured, or of course uh, in old age. Uh, which was actually true, um, even in the most pro-slavery uh, southern states. They did have many series of laws that were meant to protect the life of slaves, uh, which was something, even though slavery wasn't abolished, uh, the founding doctrine did find uh, some roots in that it, it even if they would admit it, uh, slaves were still treated as humans in many systems of the law. Uh, that provided for their protection and put certain restrictions. Now, how often these were enforced, yeah, you know, it's a whole different subject uh, based on kind of the localities. But another uh, another idea put forward by uh, Mitzer Fitzhugh here is that socialism is also a good solution uh, to the larger black-white kind of, uh, I guess, conflict uh, in that there's no way that free blacks could ever hope to compete with whites in a free labor system. And the reason for this was, of course, you know, going along with the guiding Democratic Party philosophy at the time, that blacks were not only intellectually inferior to whites, but they had insufficient work ethic as well. So we're getting a little hint of that environmental determinism in there as well, uh, as well, and, you know, in addition to just kind of a, a convenient kind of prejudice and stereotype. Uh, he also, and this was a positive argument throughout the time, uh, you know, Southern slavery protected blacks from even worse life in Africa and, and crueler forms of slavery in Africa. And, of course, it had the added benefit of introducing him to Christianity. Uh, so the, 
the he kind of claimed that this exposure then instilled in them a sense of morality that they would never have achieved, you know, in barbaric, savage Africa. And, of course, nestled within that idea is that, you know, you're saving souls, right? Uh, left to their own devices, they would inevitably uh, not uh, <laughs> muster support to uh, to pass into heaven. Uh, so the, the slave owner is not just providing for them materially, but... I guess protecting their immortal souls. Uh, you know that. Now, what Fitz he does that's unique to this, though, is he starts to adopt this idea of wage slavery, uh, which again was not a new idea. Uh, it was posited, of course, by Marx and by others before him. Uh, and really, it's kind of been an element of economic theory. Well probably since it was ever imagined. So he incorporates this, though, into the larger uh, kind of, kind of uh, social slavery development at the time because, you know, the north at this point is heavily industrialized. Uh, their production capacity far outpaced the south. Uh, their employed populations far outpaced the south. But Fitzhugh argued that blacks who were enslaved in the south actually were more moral than free white laborers. And he claims that these white laborers in the North are in fact criminals who beat and murder their wives on a daily basis. So he really deviates kind of from the believability to the sensational. But that wasn't uncommon. Uh, you know, a lot of Democrat propaganda at the time uh, conflated the idea of free slaves with forced marriage to white women, for example, fears about the mixing of the races, white purity, blood purity, you know, uh, amalgamation and miscegenation, all timeless forms of propaganda meant to keep the, you know, that 76% of non-slaveholding white population in the South invested emotionally through their passions into the slave issue where it actually just hurt them materially because it destroyed any any hope of a fair labor market in the South. Now, Fitzhugh goes on and argues that black slaves, they enjoy a kind of leisure and comfort, while presumably uh, whites would die from ennui, from just, this, this, just too much leisure time. You know, slaves, their, their life was so easy that... And so, I guess, carefree and, and devoid of work that white laborers would somehow just go mad from, a, from boredom. Uh, now, it's, what's particularly interesting is he starts to bring in this idea of capitalistic exploitation, which, of course, is not only the, is the Calhounist idea of you know, north-south, free slave, oppressor-oppressed, but he draws it directly into kind of the redistributionist collectivist economic models uh, put forward, you know, by leading socialists and, of course, Marxists. Uh, so he argues that by virtue of their uh, owning slaves, that masters are, in fact, ex are involved in the exchange of labor with their slaves. So unlike... The North, where if somebody works and you pay them, that's considered exploitation. In the South, when your slaves work and you give them an attaboy, well, that's you know that that's preferable and morally superior, apparently. So what's unique about uh, how he uh, addresses this too is he considers slavery to be the very best form of socialism, and he explains this pretty clearly. Uh, he writes. This is a quote, uh, slavery proposes to do away with free competition, to afford protection and support at all times to the laboring class, to bring about at least a qualified community of property, and to associate labor. All these purposes slavery fully and perfectly attains. Socialism is already slavery and all save the master. Only our quarrel, our socialism is that it will not honestly admit that it owes its recent revival to the failure of universal liberty and is seeking to bring about slavery again in some form. So Fitzhugh 
considers socialism to be slavery, uh, just kind of a modernized form and really kind of a, I, to, to coin a, a more modern phrase, kind of a politically correct form of, of slavery. Uh, and this is kind of a rare glimpse of, of honesty because uh, throughout the 20th century, of course, socialism would become a hallmark of the uh, ruling elite, the uh, highly educated, you know, socialism was the thing that intellectuals understood to be a truism and the best way forward, uh, even though its roots uh, stem from anything but. Now, Fitzhugh also wrote a piece called Cannibals All, and he starts to uh, explain kind of the the, the divine aspect of slavery. And he sees in slavery a reflection of uh, kind of a secular order as well. So he writes, uh, The order and subordination observable in the physical, animal, and human world show that some are formed for higher and others for lower stations, the few to command and the many to obey. We conclude that about 19 out of every 20 individuals have a natural and inalienable right to be taken care of and protected, to have guardians, trustees, husbands, or masters. In other words, they have a natural and inalienable right to be slaves. So Fitzhugh's taking the language of the Declaration kind of spitefully here uh, and positing that 95% of people deserve to be slaves. And he even considers that and defines it as a natural and unalienable right, which of course implies that, that these people are not held in a condition of slavery and servitude, that you're uh, actually committing kind of a moral injustice against them. And note the interesting words that he uses to describe slavery. Uh, as in slavery, he describes as a fulfillment of this natural and unalienable right. Uh, to be taken care of and protected, to have guardians, trustees, husbands, or masters. And so this is obviously a a very uh, dramatic perversion and distortion of what of natural rights theory. But is it, really? Because uh, what Fitzhugh is positing here uh, would later be, uh, be considered positive freedoms. Uh, FDR... Uh, the United Nations, uh, and 20th century socialists, Marxists, communists, uh, that kind of group began to argue that you have a right to a good education, you have a right to a good home, you have a right to uh, to this myriad of things um, that cannot actually be actually defined as natural or civil rights. And Fitzhugh uh, was ahead of the pack in that regard. And what's interesting, though, is he attributes these uh, so-called rights as being hallmarks of slavery. So, food for thought on that one uh, makes you wonder, then, uh, in that relationship that Fitzhugh describes here, if uh, if these positive freedoms actually kind of re-enliven in a sense of slavery, a subservience of owe- owing to a paternalistic figure. Now, this, this, this massive plan of slavery that Fitzhugh talks about uh, was a social and moral imperative. He, uh, towards the end of this particular uh, installment, he writes, It is the duty of society to protect the weak, but protection cannot be efficient without the power of control. Therefore, it is the duty of society to enslave the weak, now, again, we can apply this to concepts of positive freedoms as they were evolved and explored and implemented on uh, the 20th century, especially, uh, where, again, it's this kind of this paternalistic idea of protecting the weak. But in order to protect, in order to provide all these great things, you have to necessarily control these populations, uh, which then he just refers to that control of slavery. Uh, but if we just adopt... Uh, you know, the former, well, you have to control populations to protect them. Uh, I think the, uh, how that echoes uh, into the present day uh, speaks for itself. Uh, but So George Fitzhugh is, is one of those figures that is uh, largely ignored in history. But it's important to understand that these ideas that he's presenting here, you know, we hear them and we kind of, we kind of laugh and scoff a little bit. 
because we understand historical experience in that regard. Um, but at the time, he was one of the most widely read and published uh, kind of social contributors. So his ideas were being consumed and entertained with a level of seriousness that they don't uh, foster today. Although one wonders, uh, especially given the uh, racist roots uh, of Marxism and kind of the paternalistic uh, idea of a ruling elite, you know, a vanguard, really how much uh, anybody on the, uh, the communist Marxist left would disagree with George Fitzhugh. It might take offense at the word slavery, but that's primarily just maybe offense at using a word that's no longer politically correct, and not so much because it's inaccurate. And it's for that reason, perhaps more than any other, that he's largely omitted from the historical record, uh, despite being a leading Democrat in the 1850s and a Confederate, uh, and really contributing immensely to this kind of ongoing unification of uh, redistributionist collectivist ideologies into the Democratic Party, you know, beginning with uh, Calhounism and its adoption of the left Hegelianism and uh, Babufism. Uh, so some of the earliest roots uh, that would later evolve into Marxism and communism uh, were already, already firmly planted in the leading uh, Democrat philosophy uh, in 1850 or even earlier. Uh, so it's not necessarily a, uh, a new pattern, uh, really began with its formation. And this pattern will continue to reveal itself uh, with the evolution of the party, uh, first through the Civil War and secession, later in Reconstruction, and then again through the adoption, uh, first of progressivism, and then increasingly uh, concepts uh, proposed in uh, by the Communist Party USA and the Socialist Party, which the absorption absorption was so complete that an examination of party platforms during that time period actually demonstrates uh, near synonymy between the two.